Well, we actually haven't sent out a newsletter this month. Uh, I was getting ready to do one, but um, we were actually in Indonesia and Malaysia uh, for the whole month of March and it part into April. And to be very honest with you, I, I've been on many trips, but it was probably the best, especially the best overseas trip I've ever been on. Um, just the, the number of healings, miracles, things that, that took place uh, w- was greater than, than we've ever seen. Uh, matter of fact, we, we actually had a young man that put the meetings together. He's one of our leadership team. Uh, and he had uh, videotaped a, a lot of the material and a lot of the different meetings. We were in Jakarta. Then we went to Medan. Then we went to Kudus and then to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And he videotaped all the different meetings, the healing services. Everywhere we went, the healing services had to be moved to uh, larger facilities because the, the, the people they had counted on being there was there, but also the people they hadn't counted on, which were the Muslims, were coming into the healing services. And it was amazing. We saw as many Muslims healed as we saw Christians and other unbelievers healed. Um, the last meetings, matter of fact, we had to stay in, in one place. We stayed in a compound that had walls and barbed wire fence and armed guards that actually were security guards to help protect uh, all the Christians that were staying there because of threats of Muslim extremists. And they said the last meetings that were held there, they were actually shut down because some young radicals uh, stormed the church they were in and didn't do any real damage but caused enough commotion that the local police uh, blamed the Christians and basically said this is going on because you're here as opposed to the guys coming in and causing the the thing. Uh, And so they shut the meetings down and they actually ran all the Christians out and so they were kind of expecting that to happen again because it worked last time. And uh, but instead even the church we were in also had armed guards sitting at the front gate. The churches have walls around them and everything. And it was, um, it was real interesting because whenever the Muslims started showing up, you could obviously spot them. But um, it was just funny because at first the security personnel were kind of uh, alarmed <laughs> that they were showing up. But it, when they started seeing them carrying children and carrying their loved ones in, in their arms, and sometimes on stretchers and different things like that, then they realized that they weren't there for trouble. And so when we started having the healing service, when the, the Muslims started getting, they were some of the first to get healed, blind eyes open, and it was just amazing. And so we got most of this on videotape, and uh, the, the DVD will be available. They're actually reproducing it now. And we're not selling it, we're giving it away. Uh, it'll be on our website. Uh, it should be up any time. And so if you go to the website and check it out, you'll see it there. But uh, if you're at the meetings, any actually from now on, I will have copies of it. I just didn't have them ready. Tried to, but just didn't have them ready. Um, but those meetings, we did things. It, it, the, the amazing thing about them is that we went there and taught the exact same thing that we teach everywhere. But the difference is I had to work with an interpreter. And this last year, I have worked more with an interpreter than I have without one, uh, even in the United States. I have spoken more with an interpreter than without one. Uh, I've been in in the early part of, well, last year and for early part of this year, I have been preaching in more uh, Russian churches than English-speaking churches. And the Russian churches now are also broadcasting all of our meetings into Russia. And this is just spreading. It, it is amazing just the testimonies we're getting back. So in working with an interpreter, you obviously have to slow down. Uh, I, I tend to speak fast anyway, and so I have to really slow down. I, I pray in tongues a lot. When you pray in tongues a lot, you tend to talk in your native language faster also. And so, uh, in working with an interpreter, I had to slow down, which means we had the same three days allotted for the training, but if I speak and then the interpreter speaks, it means we only get half the material out. And yet, the healings have been greater than whenever I got all the material out, okay? And the reason being, for the most part, is that especially when we go overseas or we speak with an interpreter, we purposely keep the message simple. 
because a lot of times the interpreter can't translate uh, detailed theological terms or, or ideas. And so you, you just keep it simple. And so one thing I'm absolutely convinced is that what we don't need is more theology. That we need, it, we need to keep it simple and direct. And if anything, I'm kind of going the opposite direction of the way most teaching goes in that we are breaking this down. I'm talking slower so you can get the points more concise. Uh, I'm taking my time to formulate my thoughts so that when I make a statement, I don't have to go back later and explain it. And so as we go through this, one of the things we started doing in other places is that we noticed that as we were teaching in times past, and if you've got the other DHDs on CD or DVD, you'll notice we usually start with some background, and we're going to do that today some. Then we'll go into the Word of God as our final authority, so we have to stand by the Word of God, which is absolutely true. Then we go into usually somewhere along the lines of the New Covenant mentality as opposed to an Old Covenant mentality, and then on into healing and the atonement and that kind of thing. But, and, and what we do is we kill these sacred cows along the way. Now, when I say sacred cow, what I mean is we get that from the idea of India. In India, there are people that are starving to death while cattle, fat, healthy cattle, walk past the people. Right? Now, I'm from Texas, and that just bothers me. All right? So, and, you know, being from Texas, we know how to barbecue. All right? And so, one of the things that we noticed is that it is people's religious ideas and traditions that allow people to die of starvation while cattle are walking past them. And so, in thinking about that and looking at it, I started realizing that that's what the Pharisees did. That they were more interested in keeping their traditions than in the fact that Jesus got people healed and set free even when he violated their traditions. They didn't really care about him healing. It was the day he healed on. Right? Which says something about their mentality and their heart. And what I found is that the church has become very similar to that. That we are more interested in making sure that we hold to our particular church's theological position more than we are interested in helping people. And we have to realize that Jesus helped people way before any particular church had their theological position. Right? And so, what we found out was that these traditions, these thoughts, a tradition is, is just something that has been built up. Now, there are good traditions. Paul said, you know, you know the traditions that we do, and you've kept them. So there are good traditions, and then there are bad traditions. <clears throat> what we've done in chapter 10 is that we have taken roughly, I think, 30, 35 different things. Look real quick here. Um, what we call traditions. Yep, 30, well, 35 actual, and 36 says others. <clears throat> and these are some of the main ones that end up having to do with questions people ask and different things along the way. And what I found out is that as we have gone through the material in the traditional way, the way that we've done it in the past, it seemed to take a while to break through people's traditions and to break through to where they could actually see what we're talking about. And I started wondering why, and then I realized, based on talking with people, especially during breaks and things like that, is that we would be hitting certain, you know, I'd be going through chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and during that time, people are coming up and saying, yeah, but what about this? What about that? And I'm like, well, we'll get there. Well, we'll get there. Well, don't worry. We're, we're going we're gonna to cover that. And I started realizing that the whole time I was speaking and trying to get everybody on common ground, kind of get them all gathered so we could head in the right direction, most of the time they didn't ever even hear what I was saying because their traditions were there. Every time I'd say, well, and, and God wants to heal everyone. Oh, yeah, but what about? But what about this? But what about that? What about this? What about? And all their traditions were blocking out <clears throat> the Word of God to even get them going in the right direction. And so what we started doing in many places now is that we go right to these sacred cows, just go through the list, knock them out, show you from Scripture, give you Scripture, uh, not just Scripture, Scripture and what, would, what I would even call common sense, which apparently isn't all that common, 
but I would give these out. And once we destroy those, then we can go back to chapters 1, 2, and 3, and the people just grab it. Because all of these hindrances are out of the way. Now, one statement I make pretty consistently is that, you know, just as a, as a blanket statement, the only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe there are hindrances to healing. That's it. All right? Sin don't stop healing. Um, the sick person's unbelief won't stop it. I mean, I, I, we'll just go through all of these. I mean, I have taken everything that is taught in the church, and, and this is the way I usually say it. If you want to practice Bible healing, just take everything you've been taught in the church and do the exact opposite. And if you do, you'll be closer to what the Bible says about healing. Right? I used to tell people that what the church is taught... Or, now, I'm not talking about any one church. I'm talking about the church as a whole. That roughly about 95% of what the church is taught on healing is wrong. And the only reason I said 95% is because I want to give you some hope that all your going to church hadn't been in vain. Right? In reality, it's more like 99.9%. Okay? Uh, actually, I hadn't really found anything that the church has taught in the last hundred years, especially... Uh, that holds up to Scripture and that won't be destroyed if you read Scripture. Now, my job is very simple. All I really do is read Scripture to you and go, that it means what it says, all right? As opposed to trying to do away with it somehow. So, we're going to go through these. Won't get them all done in one session, but we're going to run through these kind of quick just to get these out so that you'll. I, I just want to kill these things so that you can actually hear where we're going, all right? First off, doubt. People say, well, okay, I doubt. Well, how do I doubt? You know, if doubt is there, then it can't get healed. All right, well, let's talk about what doubt is. First off, and matter of fact, it's even in, uh, I think, chapter 3 or somewhere there too, you'll see the actual definition and everything. But the word doubt actually means to stop, hesitate, or back off. That's what it means. Now, it, it, in a theological sense, it means to thoroughly divide. Right? Now, that sounds kind of funny because... That's exactly what you do in theological studies. Is you take scripture and you tear it apart and you thoroughly divide it. But yet that's the definition for doubt. right? So I'm not saying that you shouldn't study the word of God. You should study it. But don't let your study become more God to you than the God you're studying. All right? For example, one of, the, one of our problems has been is that we have made faith our God as opposed to faith in God. You understand? We're not to have faith in our faith. Nowhere does the Bible say have faith in your faith. The Bible says have faith in God. When you have faith in your faith, that's humanism. Right? That's all it is. And when you have faith in your faith, then you, it's still faith in you, and then it comes back to you, and then you start talking about how you can fail and what can happen. And we see that evidence mainly in how people say, well, I just don't know if I have enough faith for this. Well, then it's about you. And it's not about you. Nothing in the Bible is about you, per se. Right? It's about God. It's about Jesus. It's about what He did. So our faith in God... Matter of fact, if you... Um, you don't have to go there now. We'll, we might talk about it a little bit later on. But even in your own time, you might look up Hebrews 11. And somewhere around... Uh, what is it? Well, actually, I'm not sure because that's another verse I was thinking of. But it says that... When it talks about Abraham and Sarah, it said that God... Now... Think about this. There's only two women in Hebrews 11. One is Sarah. One is Rahab the harlot. Right? You got Sarah, the mother of faith, so to speak. A woman of purity and honor. And then you have a, a harlot. And those are the only two women in Hebrews 11. Which is, I believe that God put those two. Because all women can find themselves somewhere between the two. So, you know, one end, they're basically two ends of the spectrum. And so any woman can be a woman of faith. Amen? Now, what it says about her, though, is this. It's, and the funny thing is, all the people put in Hebrews 11 are people of faith. And they demonstrated faith, and they were honored because of their faith. But what it says about Sarah was that she considered God faithful who had promised. That's why she's in Hebrews 11. We think it's because God says she had faith, but basically it was because God said that she counted him faithful. If you want the simplest definition of faith, that's it. It is to consider God faithful who had promised. Isn't that easy? You just say, you just, Him. 
So it's not about you. Well, and when people say, well, I just don't know if I have enough faith, then usually I like to expose that to them, not in front of other people, but I like to expose that to them themselves by saying, yeah, I know God, he's such a liar. Isn't he hard to believe? He's just really, you know, you just can't believe a word he says. And then they look at me shocked, and I say, that's what you just said. You just said you didn't think that you could have that much faith in God. And if you can't have faith in someone, it's because they're a liar. Isn't that right? So the first thing we have to realize is that faith is not hard. Faith is a choice. You read Hebrews 11. You want to understand what Hebrew, what faith is? It's very simple. I learned this directly from Dr. Lester Sumrall. I spent several years with him. And if anything, that's what he taught and exemplified was faith. I saw him write a contract for a $10 million television station when he was in the middle of a building project, of building his, the, the new church there. And I know he didn't have $500 in the bank account. And yet he signed a $10 million contract that was due in 30 days. Right? Now that could either be total foolishness or it's faith. One of the two. Well, with him, I'm not telling you to go do that because I don't know you. All right? But with him, it was faith. Okay? And because he knew, he counted him faithful who had promised that whatever he needed, he would have to accomplish the will of God. And so, essentially, that's what it comes down to. So, doubt is very simple. <clears throat> Let's say, I'll give you the best illustration I can about it. Let's say you're walking through a grocery store, department store somewhere. Let's say you're pushing your buggy or whatever it is you got. And you've been through this seminar, so you're convinced that healing is always God's will. God wants everyone healed. You know, there's just no excuses now. It's just a matter of do it or don't. And you see a person sitting on the side, and they're sick. And you can tell they're sick. And you think, here's my chance. I'm going to go. I'm going to lay hands on them. God's going to heal them. It's going to be good. And so you start walking toward them. And before you even get there, you're going to have a thought. That's going to say, what if it don't happen? And then you're going to think, oh, I just doubted. Now it ain't going to matter if I do it or not, because now I doubted, so it ain't going to work. So I might as well not even try. Now, the Bible says that before you can sin, you have to be tempted to sin. Right? You can't have a sin. You can't sin without being tempted. Right? Temptation comes before the sin. Then you decide to act on the temptation, which leads to sin. Right? Now, the Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. Right? So can you doubt in faith? No, of course not, right? <clears throat> so doubting is sin, right? So when you walk over there, now, now think about this, because if doubting is sin, then, and before you sin, you have to be tempted, then before you doubt, you have to be tempted to doubt, right? Right? So when you walk over toward that person, you're ready to lay hands, and you hear that thought that says, what if it don't happen? And you go, ah, I've doubted. Okay, if you've doubted, you've sinned. If you've sinned, that means you went through the temptation process first. When were you tempted to doubt before that thought? There was no temptation before that. So that thought, what if it don't happen, is not the doubt, it's the temptation. You understand? Now, doubt is when you hear that thought, and you stop, hesitate, or back off. So now you can see how... Now, the devil is not smart, right? Because it wasn't smart to rebel against God. But he is very cunning. And this shows how he has deceived the church. Because he made you think that you've doubted when you've not even doubted. And so whenever you think you've doubted... Then you stop, hesitate, or back off, and then you actually doubt. So he actually tricks you into doubting when you haven't yet doubted. He just tempted you to doubt, right? Now, at that moment that you're stepping forward, ready to lay hands on him, and you have that thought. Now, what you have to remember is this. Because usually what he says is, what if it don't happen? You're going to look stupid. You're going to get, as people say, I'm going to give God a black eye if it doesn't work. Okay, you're really not worried about God's black eye. You're worried about your reputation, right? Generally, that's why you back off. But you have that thought, what if it doesn't work? Now, the devil's tactics haven't changed. If you go back to the garden, that's exactly what he did with Eve. It's exactly the same process. God said, 
You can eat of all these trees, just don't touch that one. Then the serpent comes along and says, has God really said? Now, isn't that exactly what he says whenever you start to lay hands on a person? When you, when you hear that thought, what if it don't happen? Isn't that Satan saying, has God really said believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover? And that's as if, see, the devil's tactic, he doesn't have to get you to follow him and become a Satanist. Right? All he's got to do is get you not to believe God. And that's his job, is to try to get you not to believe. So his job is to tempt you to doubt, because once you make the decision, he can't do anything about it. <clears throat> think about this. If he could stop you from truly following God, don't you think he would have done that while he owned you? Before you made the decision to actually follow him? If he couldn't keep you when he owned you, what makes you think that he can control you after he no longer owns you? Amen? Now, so to doubt means simply to know what you're supposed to do and to stop, hesitate, or back off. Amen? So, you can scratch that first one off. Number two, one person's faith. Now, one of the main doctrines that are in the church is that for a person to be healed, they have to have faith. And what we see in Jesus' ministry is many times people came that had faith, and every time Jesus found faith, he would commend it. He would say, this is good, you've got great faith, it's good, your faith has healed you. Or, or he would say something along the lines of, uh, according to your faith, be it done unto you. Or according as you have believed, be it done unto you. Things like that. And people will say, see, they had to have faith. Okay, you make kind of a big jump from Jesus recognizing faith to someone saying they had to have faith or it would not have happened. You, you see what I'm saying? Just a simple matter of logic says that that's a pretty big jump. Because nowhere did Jesus say, man, I, I, I really wish I could help you, but since you don't have faith, I'm sorry, I can't help you. You don't see that anywhere. All right. Now, people say, well, what about in, in Matthew when it says that you know, he could do no mighty works there in his own hometown because of their unbelief. Well, if you read what actually happened there, it says, well, it says it in uh, Matthew 15, or Matthew 13, and, it says, and then it says it also in uh, Mark chapter 9, but it says that he could do no mighty works there except, or the King James says save, he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. So, if he couldn't do any mighty works because of their unbelief, Yet he did lay hands on the sick and they did get healed. So actually, the verse people try to use to say that people couldn't get healed because of their unbelief actually says the opposite. It actually says that the people there were in unbelief and yet Jesus healed a few sick people anyway. And so the idea that there has to be faith on the part of the people doesn't. Now, what it actually says there is that they were offended at him because that was the same place where they said, isn't this... Joseph's son, isn't this, a, you know, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't it, we have his mother and his brother and his sisters here. You know, he's, he's nobody. And so they were offended at him. And a matter of fact, they, at one point they even tried to throw him off a cliff. So they weren't too hop, happy with him. Now, when people don't like you, they generally don't show up at your meetings. Right? And they especially don't come down front for you to lay hands on them and get them healed. Right? They stay at the back and murmur and grumble and complain and try to say things about you like, well, we know who you are and, you know, we, we heard the rumors about you, your mother and your father and how she was pregnant before uh, the, they got married. And they would spread rumors instead of coming down to be ministered. But the fact is, when it says that every time you find a person that needed healing, every time, <clears throat> faith wasn't always mentioned, but when it was mentioned, if the person had faith, Jesus commended the faith. But, there were several instances where nobody had faith, right? Many times nobody had faith, nobody operated in faith, and the only person there with faith was Jesus. So there were many times whenever he had faith for others. As an example, the, um, when the Roman centurion came to Jesus and said, My servant, lie sick. Jesus said, You, the Roman centurion, you have great faith. But who got healed? The servant. So the Roman had faith for somebody else. There's no evidence that the servant had any faith. Right? Matter of fact, Jesus even said, what you believe, that's the way it's done. Now, <clears throat> so you have to understand that here is a prime case 
of one person having faith for another person. So the sick person does not have to have faith for themselves. Right? Now I can show you, as a matter of fact, I, later on we'll probably go through this, but I have, um, I'm preparing a new manual that will probably take me several more months yet to get finished and ready, you know, to have it printed. But in it, I go through a chapter called Whose Faith, and I take every healing in the New Testament and show who was sick, who had faith, and who the healer was. Well, of course, the healer is always Jesus, or in some cases it's the disciples, but yet we know it's the Spirit of God working through them. <clears throat> but it's almost always a third-party case. And so we'll show you those as we go along. Now, so the idea and what has been taught many times is, well, we have to get them in, preach to them so they can get faith, so they can get healed. Right? Now, I don't have this in your manual, but you might want to write it down when we get there. But go with me quickly to where want to go? Uh, Luke. We'll go to Luke. Is it 10? I think it's Luke 10 is where I'm going. Yeah, Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, not going into all the details, we will read this in more detail later. I'm just pointing this out so you can write it down under number 2 in your manual. In verse 1 it says, After these things the Lord appointed other 70 also. Now, just for those, and this is another sacred cow, people say, well, only Jesus could heal. Well, we know that ain't true. First off, he healed. Then he had his 12 disciples, one of which was Judas, right? That Jesus said was a devil from the beginning, basically. He was stealing out of the purse, right? And healing the sick at the same time. All right? So it went on at the same time. And it said, whenever he sent them out, it said that he sent the twelve out, and the twelve came back, saying, even the devils are subject to us through your name. That's Judas also. All right? So even though he was in sin, he still had power over devils. All right? So there goes some theology right there. Anyway. So we have Jesus and we have the 12, that's 13 doing it. Then Jesus sent 70 more, right? So that's 83 that were healing the sick. So it wasn't just Jesus. We don't even know all the 70. They didn't even give their names. So apparently having power doesn't rate you getting your name listed in the Bible. Right? Having faith many times does, but not having just power. Okay? Then... Also, there was another one that they said, Lord, we saw a guy out there casting out devils in your name, but he didn't travel with us, so we told him to stop. Right? So here's a guy that wasn't even a part of the group, that didn't even give his name. Apparently, he heard that if you use the name of Jesus, you can cast out devils. And he did it. And he had faith in the name. Right? But yet, whenever Jesus' disciples came back and said, told him that, he didn't say, well, good for you. I'm glad you stopped it because, you know, we don't even know this guy. And he doesn't travel with us and who knows what else he's teaching. He didn't say that. He said, why did you stop him? You shouldn't stop him. If he's doing miracles, if he's doing mighty works in my name, he's not going to speak evil of me. So instead of being denominational and dividing and saying, well, they're not part of our group, Jesus said, hey, if they're my name and doing good, good works and helping people, leave them alone. Right? So that's 84 people that were healing the sick, casting out devils, doing works of God. So that proves, and, and this guy, obviously, he's the, he's the prime example because he didn't travel with them. He wasn't around them. He wasn't sent out by Jesus. So that pretty much destroys every aspect of healing teaching that's out there today. Right? Jesus didn't lay his hands on him. Jesus didn't give him an anointing. The man had faith in the name of Jesus. Right? Now, later on, we see these seven sons of Sceva that went out to try to cast out devils and they said, you know, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches. Well, they didn't have faith in the name. Right? They said the, the Jesus whom Paul... They just heard Paul preaching and said, well, we're going to use this formula too. And the devil said, well, formulas don't work. Right? And he jumped on them, stripped them naked and chased them down the street. Right? Now, that would have been a church service. Amen? <laughs> okay? Okay? <laughs> so, but... So it, it just goes to show that... And it's funny thing is too, it names them. Didn't name the guy that was doing it. 
but it names the guys that tried it and got chased down the street naked. Right? So that gives you an idea. It's, the Bible says everything hidden is going to be revealed. Amen? Sometimes literally, sometimes not, but here these guys' names were publicly humiliated. All right? Then he said, therefore, verse 2, or I guess I ought to read verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also and sent him two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Therefore, or because he sent them out, he said unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, stop right there. Notice two things. Number one, we're in Luke chapter 10, and Luke goes on to what? Chapter 24. Four, I think it is, 20, yeah. And so, we're not even halfway through here, and yet he's sending the disciples out, right? They had been with him less than a year. They were not fully trained, right? He sent them out, and they came back in. The key here, and you'll notice this, I pointed out in several other places, we do, ex you're going to hear me mention a term called the backwards church. Which means basically whatever the church does is usually the exact backwards or reverse or opposite of what the Bible says. And so whenever I see these cases, I try to point them out. So this is a case of the backwards church right here. You'll notice this. The church emphasizes the readiness of the worker. Jesus never emphasized the readiness of the worker. He always emphasized the need and the readiness of the harvest. See, we're always saying, well, I, I'm in God's greenhouse. God's teaching me. I'm not ready yet. I've got to learn more. I've got to know more. I gotta, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm preparing. No. Jesus said, while you're preparing, the field is dying. And I can promise you, you will never learn. See, you read a book about anybody, right? You pick any biography. I've read a bunch of different biographies. I love military biographies. Uh, Patton, Jackson... Robert E. Lee, the, I've read these biographies, especially Jackson, uh, he was a strange character, but amazing. And I know there are people, as a matter of fact, I, when I was in VMI recently, I met the author of uh, uh, several of Jackson's biographies. Now, I've read those biographies. Do I know Jackson? No, I know about Jackson, right? Because I've read about him. But I don't know him. Now I can, I can get to know a lot about him. I can know so much about him. That I probably could know more about him. Than some people that knew him. Right? Because there would be certain parts of his life. That some people wouldn't know about. But even though I might know more about him. Than some people. I don't know him. Because I never met him. Right? Now you can know. A whole lot about the Bible. Because you've read it, you've studied it, you sit and you hear it. But you will never know the Bible until you do it. You understand? So until you get into the harvest. Now, when we first started teaching, there was... Um, honestly, I knew probably 10% of what I know today about healing. But I didn't learn necessarily by teaching. It was by doing. It was by laying hands on the sick and praying for well over 70,000 people now. Different situations and different things that have gone on, I have learned by experience that the Bible backs up. Now, I don't judge the Bible by my experience. I judge my experience by the Bible. Right? Now, but as you go and do, and, and we usually talk about this uh, actually a little bit later on, but since we're in this, we have to get into it. Back when, especially when I was in the military, right when I got out, I've, I've always, uh, I've never been into a lot of different games and stuff. Uh, military games, enjoyed, of course. Uh, games of uh, strategy and skill, chess, things like that, I enjoyed that. But as far as just cards, poker, I don't know anything about card games. I've never played a card game. I, I could care less, all right? I don't know any of the rules or anything else. Now, <clears throat> One game I did like, and, and still do, just don't get a chance to play it really anymore because you can't find a decent place to play it, was pool. I used to love to shoot pool. 
And so when I first got out of the military, I would go to a, a bar. My, my parents actually owned a bar when I was young. And I've never tasted alcohol, even though my parents owned a bar and I was raised around one. Alcohol, I've, I've, I have hated alcohol since I was a child, all right? I made a vow to God when I was nine, I would never touch alcohol and I've never broken it. Um, so I just, I could, I, me going into a bar didn't bother me because I didn't go into drink or to do the things that people did. I went in to play pool. And honestly, the best pool players are usually in bars, right? I, I've not found a lot of good pool players in church, all right? <laughs> I mean, I know there's some, but, but I guarantee at one point, if they're a good pool player in church, at one time they were in the bar. Okay, so, okay, so, you know, the, the theory still holds true, okay? Now, but I would go into the bars to play pool, and when I would go in, a lot of times there'd be ex-military or somebody sitting there, and sometimes they weren't even ex-military. Sometimes they were just military enthusiasts, and they were usually the ones that you could spot because they'd have a uniform of some type on, you know, camouflage and something, they'd be sitting there. And they'd be talking, and they'd be saying stuff like, well, yeah, that M16, that thing's a fine weapon, I'll tell you that, that, that M16, you know, it'll fire 5,000 rounds a minute. And, and, and it, if it misses you by three inches, it'll rip the muscle out of your arm just from the vacuum of the bullet. Well, if you've never shot one, you may stand there and go, wow, really, wow, M16, that is a good weapon. Eh? But, if you've, but if you've actually shot one, then you're not going to listen to that garbage very long without saying, uh, you're either lying and know it, or you've never shot one. Right Now, the reason I wouldn't be fooled was because I've shot one. Right? And to be honest with you, if you've ever shot one, you know they're not, that, or in the past, now the A4s they have now, now are, I hear much better, but the original M16s were not good weapons, especially during Vietnam. And they, I mean, they get, man, mud put in them at all, or any dirt or anything, and they'd jam up on you, and you couldn't even get a, a whole magazine to go through them. Uh, that's why, I, again, in, in Vietnam War, a lot of our guys would throw them down, pick up the AK-47s and, you know, they could be packed with mud. You bang them against a wall, chamber them, and they'd fire. And, and still the most prevalent weapon out there, especially in third world countries. And so when you, uh, but the reason I wasn't fooled is because I'd fired one. And I knew it wasn't that good of a weapon. But if I'd never fired one, then I would have been convinced that this guy knew what he was talking about. And unfortunately, I would have gone off and someone said, oh, you read this, read this about the M16? Oh yeah, the M16, oh that's a good weapon, man. That thing, will, it'll shoot 5,000 rounds and, and it, well, what am I doing? I'm repeating what I heard, right? And unfortunately, the guy I heard it from was either lying or wrong. That's the church. See, we, we've read a lot about things, but the traditions that have been passed to us have been passed to us by people that didn't do it. They heard stories of somebody else that did it. Or they were taught a, a theory. Now basically all of our theology today is a theology of failure. In other words, we came up, we devised our theology based on failures that we've had. You know, well God doesn't always heal. Well, why would you say that? Well, I prayed for somebody and they died. See, that's a theology of failure. You base your theology on your experiences, not based on the Word of God. Why don't you say, God always heals if you believe? And then it comes back to, you didn't believe. Simple as that. So it wasn't God's failure. One thing you'll notice in the Bible, every time God puts an if, it's always on the part of the man. He always says, if you do that, I'll do this. He never, puts in, he never says, if, now listen, you do that, and I might do this. He never says that. He always says, if you do that part, I will do this part. Isn't that right? The if is always on man's part because there is no if on God's part. God's part is solid. He is the most predictable human being in existence. He wrote in his book exactly what he will do. And the good thing is, he's powerful enough to back it up so that even if the enemy knows what he's going to do, he can't stop it. You know, I always give the illustration that and this kind of goes back to our history, which I'll get into a little bit later on. But in my early days, especially when I was in the martial arts, I was, I, I just had a habit of going to the best to learn from. I mean, that was the idea. And when I wanted to learn uh, hand speed, when I wanted to get my hand speed up and use my hands better, I found the person who had the fastest hands on record, which at that time was a man named William Chung, who was head of the Wing Chun system. He actually 
introduced Bruce Lee to Yip Man, which was his instructor, and was technically Bruce Lee's instructor for the first about three and a half years of Bruce Lee's training in Wing Chun Kung Fu. And so when I heard about, this man could punch eight times in one second, right? And I'm not talking about just tapping, I mean full body punches that each one could knock a person down. And, so, and they had all this on film and it was all, it was, as a matter of fact, he was in Guinness for, for many years. And when I heard that, I said, that's the man to go see, obviously, you know, go to the best. So I went and trained under him, actually became his representative for the United States for Wing Chun Kung Fu, uh, for the state of Texas, uh, his representative. And then w got my hands speed up, got to where I could use my hands effectively mm -hmm. like I wanted to. Then when I wanted to start using my legs to kick better, I had trained, but I wanted to go to the best. So at that time, the best, which was about 1976, uh, the best at that point was a man named Bill Wallace, uh, known as Superfoot Bill Wallace, because he could only kick with one leg. He had damaged his right knee in a judo accident, but uh, with his left leg, he became the world full contact karate champion, and he could kick 70 miles per hour. His foot was clocked at 70 miles per hour. And one time they did an interview with him and said, don't you think it's, um, you know, that it's not good that you can only kick with your left leg? And he said, well, it's true. People know it's coming. Problem is, they can't do anything about it. <laughs> and so, you know, 70 miles per hour, you know, you just get out of the way, which is impossible, or you get knocked out, which is what he did. And so, uh, I went to him and trained. Actually, he taught Elvis for a while there in Memphis, and I trained with him in kicking techniques. And then, so when I, when I started reading this, <clears throat> I understood that to learn something, to really know it, you got to go to the best. Go to the people that do, that, are, that have the results. You don't go to the failures, right? If I want to learn how to make money, you know, I'm not going to go, well, take your pick now. Anybody on Wall Street or anybody, <laughs> <laughs> anybody the head of GM or anybody else, or Bank of America, I guess, too. I just heard that they're kicking him out. But, um, you know, I don't know who you go to now. I guess, I don't know, Donald Trump's still hanging in there. You know, he's lost it and made it back so many times now you lose count. But, um, you know, I don't want to go, I'm not going to, let me put it this way, I'm not going to go to a guy sitting on the side of the street with a tin can, right, to learn how to make money, all right? I'm going to go to somebody that has a proven track record of doing it. Well, when I wanted to learn healing, when John Lake wanted to learn healing, he went to Dowie. When I wanted to learn healing, and I'll, I'll tell you why later on, uh, I investigated, I investigated Smith Wigglesworth and Amy Simple McPherson, and I mean everybody, but Lake stood out for one reason. Wigglesworth never reproduced himself. He kind of came close with Summerall, but he never really reproduced himself. But John Lake not only did it, but he trained people to do it that got as good a result as he did, and in some cases even better. Now, from being in the martial arts, I knew that a good fighter doesn't always make a good teacher. And a good teacher isn't always a good fighter. But when you can find a teacher who used to fight and was good at it, that's the one you want to learn under because he doesn't just teach you theory and the style. He teaches you what he knows works. Well, as we started going out and ministering to people, obviously I studied Dr. Lake's material. And I'll, again, going more into detail later. But I started realizing this man knew what he was... You can't argue with a guy that has results. You know, you really you just can't argue with it. <clears throat> Especially if you're not getting results. And so... I started going out and doing it and practicing it and I started finding out that what, what I had been taught worked to a small degree, but it wasn't good enough to get the job done. And so I started investigating deeper and found out that basically what we've done is we have created a theology of healing based on failure and based on experiences rather than a theology based on the Bible and then pushing till we get to that point. Now, I will tell you ahead of time that whenever we were, when I first got a hold of the material that I'm teaching you, uh, before I ever taught it publicly, we practiced it for nine months at our home. <clears throat> and during those nine months, every person that came to our home was healed. We had 100%. I mean, it didn't matter what they had. So in that, what I'm teaching you, <clears throat> I know works. There's no theory about it. There's, there's, now, I told God I would never teach by theory. I would only teach what I had done. And so, every principle I'll teach you this week, 
I will also give you testimony that back up the principle along with scripture. Amen? Take a break. Let's take a about a 13 minute break this time. Okay? <laughs>